were completely unexpected. Uh, not only Pfizer's vaccine, which now is in the 90, 95 uh, percent effectiveness range, but also the Moderna vaccines, which is a kissing cousin to it. That's running in 90, 95 percent uh, level. And uh, the Russians actually came out a few days ago, I don't know if you caught that one, that their vaccine is 92.2 percent effective. So we're seeing and I'm not surprised once we see that benchmark being established uh, that majority of the products, the vaccines that are using this uh, messenger RNA technology are showing similar results. And that's a very that's a very, very good thing because it's not just one company. It's all the other companies with doing their own independent trials that are coming up with virtually the same results. And, and my skepticism, of course, is because I am a scientist. I like to look at the data. I haven't seen the data yet. I've seen uh, information that the companies have presented. There's no reason to doubt it. But sometimes the devil is in the detail. Uh, I have looked very carefully at the side effects reported to date. Uh, they seem to be the kinds of things that you would generally expect from any kind of vaccine. If anybody's had the shingles vaccine, the Shingrix vaccine, they're the same kind of uh, uh, you know, side effects. Uh, pain in the injection site, inflammation. People say that with the second vaccine that they received, uh, it's a little bit more pronounced and they kind of feel tired and fatigued. But that's actually a, a good sign because that means your system is reacting to it and producing even more antibodies. So that's all very, very good. Uh, I'm watching the, the, the uh, demographics of the enrollees. Uh, about 41% are people 55 to 85. Uh, in the in the Pfizer studies as well, Pfizer studies, the demographics by uh, racial breakdown are very very close to the overall population of the United States. When you when you look at the Asian, African American, Hispanic, um, you you see that it very very closely parallels. So they're doing all the right things, but being the skeptic that I am, you know, trust with verification. I like it. Uh, I do want to see a little bit more data. So, uh, Josh, what, 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 what do you make of this? I, I, I understand Dr. Sal with uh, wanting to see more data before we uh, do more. Okay. I think we lost him. Let's rejoin the call here. Dr was alluding to uh such as excessive sweating uh pain yeah. uh, muscle pain fatigue and as some described the worst headache headache hangover that they have ever had in their life and so i wonder if it's a situation in which the cure is worse than the virus itself um i'm no doctor nor do i play one on television but when you see the um hydroxychloroquine azithromycin and zinc working at a 95, 97% success rate level and well over 6,000 international doctors, not just here in the United States, all kind of alluding to the same thing that that indeed is the cure. Uh, my thought process is why then does the government need to create another vaccine to inject us all with when we already have a cure that has worked and is showing positive signs. I don't trust anything the government does. Uh, obviously, I would trust something that maybe Trump uh, oversaw. But in reality, when I know that the cure is already there, uh, I don't foresee a reason, honestly, to have a vaccine at all. And I believe, as I've said before, Dr. Falsy, as I like to call him, uh, clearly is going to make a billion and just billions of dollars because of the fact that he is the head of the National Institute of Health for over 50 years. He's got many patents, including ones with Resdemosphere and many others. And so as long as he has his fingerprints on this, uh, I believe that there's financial benefit and reasoning behind these vaccines. And, uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed under, God forbid, a Biden presidency is pretty damn scary, that's for sure. Well... Uh, you know, we, we have cures for a lot of things. We have cures for pneumonia. Uh, we have cures for shingles. 
We have cures for a lot of things that you can vaccinate against. But, uh, and I, I understand your point, and it's a fair point. If, if only 0.5%, let's say, of the population is going to actually get severe enough symptoms, why, or severe enough disease to require hospitalization and advanced treatment, why do we go through this vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if we have a treatment, why? And we have not just the hydroxychloroquine, Zithromax, and the corticosteroids. We now also have these these antibodies, which are you know uh, little you know miraculous little things, Lilly and Regeneron's products. But the thing that I am impressed with this fact, this virus, which is unlike certain other viruses, that the it affects a lot of systems in your uh, throughout your body. Kidneys are affected, heart is affected, clotting systems are affected. There's some indication that it may have, we don't know if it's a long lasting effect on central nervous system, the brain. Uh, so there are a lot of things that people who have had the virus, they come out of it okay, but then they have long lasting symptoms. So I don't know what that means, but I do think uh, it's prudent to not get it, particularly maybe not for a nice, good looking young guy like you. But for an old old guy like me, that that can really be a disaster. It could it could cut off uh, my life in the time when I should be out enjoying myself with my fabulous wife uh, by a couple of years, and those are precious couple of years. The other is, we often think of these virus vaccines as being absolutely specific to that particular virus, but they are actually kind of specific to a class of viruses this whole SARS class. So one of the things that people are looking at, and I hope is plays out, is that it might be, it might give some general protective effect from another kind of SARS virus. Now, and then the, the, if that's not enough to convince you that a, vi a vaccine is probably a good idea, is these viruses, as everybody who's had the flu shot and gets the flu knows, uh, they do mut mutate. And the first virus, uh, first vaccines against flu virus were extremely effective. But then over time, the, the flu does what any organism does. It, it finds a way to quote uh, that line in Jurassic Park. So the other thing is this uh, COVID, uh, what we're dealing with COVID-19, we may be dealing with COVID-20, uh, which might be a little, in fact, we have seen it mutate a little bit. It's become less lethal or more contagious. Uh, at the end of the day, I think whenever you can prevent a disease, uh, and don't forget these, these other things cure the disease, uh, whenever you can prevent disease, that's preferable to trying to go and cure it because you just never know. Uh, so, you know, I, I do think it's worth it. Your other point is I don't trust the things that the government labs do. I, well, there's an awful lot of skepticism out there, but Donald Trump, uh, Tony Fauci, uh, bless their little hearts, they're not in the labs making these uh, uh, these vaccines. In fact, Pfizer took no money for development. They took a whopping sum of money for distribution uh, or, you know, to give it out, but that's so people get it free. But they didn't take any money for development. These were developed by private companies, J&J, &J, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, uh, who, all who have tremendous experience in creating vac vaccines for generations, and Moderna. So it's, you know, you're, you're really... Uh, uh, we've all been vaccinated. You've had vaccines many, many times. You couldn't go to college if you didn't have vaccines. Probably couldn't go to public school if you didn't have certain vaccines. If you were born in America, you have vaccines. So, you know, we've all gotten these vaccines and no one really gave it much thought or much worry, but these are the same companies that are doing this uh, coronavirus vaccine. So I look at this as a very positive sign and people need that hope now. Well, look, I understand and I respect the fact that you're a doctor, uh, but I also see this as uh, political to some degree. And, oh. and certainly before the election, it was certainly political, and perhaps maybe that's died down a little bit. But I see this as big tech, uh, not big tech, uh, big pharma is what I meant by that. And what I mean by that ultimately is that when you have so many of these competing companies that are making billions upon billions of dollars, you know, there's no money in cures. There's only money in treatments. And we know that, and it's been like that for many, many years. 
And again, I understand that you're a doctor and you probably see this certainly from a different perspective than myself. But I see this more as a political thing. Uh, I see this more as China working with perhaps the Democratic Party here in America to try to stop the Trump economy, to try to stop the reelection, to try to stop the rallies, and basically allowing this to come here. Um, I believe there is definitely some proof of the fact that this was created in a bio level four laboratory in Wuhan. It was done by Dr. Uh, Z, I can't remember her last name. It was a female doctor. Yes, she continuously, exactly. she, yep, she continuously spliced the gene using a uh, SARS infected mouse and the horseshoe bat. And she kept doing it and doing it and doing it over years. And eventually she was able to figure out how to transfer it, transform it transfer it, sorry, from one species to the next. And then she continued to work on that. And she eventually figured out how to get it from animal to human transmission. Mm -hmm. And I believe at that point, it was either released as a bioterrorism weapon or it escaped the lab. Obviously, we don't know 100% which one that was. And so with that being said, we know that China was getting, you know, their butts kicked uh, as far as trade uh, with uh, the United States, um, currency manipulation was being stopped and thwarted, and you know the manufacturing uh, and wholesale divisions of the Chinese economy were crashing. You know, you have a very large 600 million people in the middle, quote unquote, middle class in China, and they were all suffering because, again, President Trump was calling them out and was fighting back and everything else. So again, I see this more. From as a political expert and, and analyst, I see this more not necessarily so much as a medical perspective, but more as an a geopolitical perspective and or political perspective. And that's what I worry about. And then I worry about the fact that millions of Americans, uh, I guess for all intents and purposes, have bought into this and they're walking around with these face diapers on, as I like to call them. And it's uh, zapping their individuality. I think that when people are all covered up and covering their faces, uh, they make themselves a lot more easier to be controlled. And so, again, I see this from a, a different perspective. Um, I respect, you know, the fact that you are a doctor and you have a hell of a lot more knowledge than me on this subject. But again, as an expert in what I do, I definitely see it from a different perspective. Yes, you know, I, I do think that there is a, some very, very important important geopolitical and geoeconomic lessons to be learned from this entire set of scenarios. I am not expert in your domain, but I do, I will tell you that when I first saw the multi-system effects of this, of this virus, uh, my, I talked with my son who's a physician uh, and has a fair amount of experience in all these things as well. Uh, and I said, this, this just doesn't seem like the kind of garden variety virus that springs up uh, all of a sudden. This is very, very unusual. So I do, that. We, we won't know the truth for a while. The truth will come out. Uh, there are lots of things being looked at, uh, you know, and it's not my area, I'm not involved in skullduggery. But I do think you make your case for vaccination by talking about how our geopolitical uh, rivals uh, and our geoeconomic rivals not just in China, but elsewhere, would love to see the country thrown into disruption. And uh, it is, from a science standpoint, from a medical sciences standpoint, um, it's very, very easy to do these kinds of things. Uh, so we do need to be prepared. Uh, you know, I, I think if we are going to be subject to these types of either careless handling of dangerous materials, or deliberate development of things that could injure our population, whether it's in the food supply or the drug supply or uh, biological introductions of biological uh, factors, uh, we, we really need to be prepared to manage it. And, and unfortunately, the big le biggest lesson I hope isn't lost on the Biden administration is you've got to be protected. God forbid. Wearing, wearing masks, I, I will differ with you there. I think it's a small concession uh, to do uh, wear a mask and wash your hands. Uh, we're actually even seeing benefit now. I don't I don't know what it's like where, where you all are, 
but we're not seeing nationwide the, the amount of seasonal flu that we had seen before. So I don't know what you're observing there uh, when, when people well, get... Go ahead. I've, I've interviewed uh, quite a few infectious disease specialists, and a lot of them have said the same thing, that by wearing a mask for a prolonged period of time, you're breathing in your own CO2. And therefore, when you're doing that, you're actually lowering your immune system inhibitors. And as you lower the immune system inhibitors, it makes you more susceptible to the one thing you're trying to avoid catching, which is a virus. Now, right. others have said that if you are over a certain age, and certainly you know, if you're a doctor or if you're visiting a doctor or in a medical facility, then yes, you should definitely wear a mask. But for these folks that are driving around in their cars with the windows up wearing a mask, I mean, well, it's just, it's ridiculous. And what they're doing is you're causing an entire, I don't want to say generation, but I would say millions upon millions of Americans that have been doing this are now lowering their immune system. And I think that they're going to have other health ailments and other problems. Uh, do, uh, dentists are now seeing what they're calling mask mouth. Right, exactly. And what mask mouth is, is basically folks that unfortunately either have to because of a job or just you know voluntarily wearing a mask for a prolonged period of time, it's keeping their mouth dry. It's keeping the saliva glands from actively working. And it's allowing the bacteria to cake and build up in their mouth, thus causing severe uh, gum disease and things of that nature. And they're seeing people that have really bad gums and teeth that you would see in, in a normal, you know, meth addict or something right. like that. And so again, I think there's a lot of precautions that we have to have. And I can't, I can't just automatically say that putting on a mask is going to keep you from getting viruses. There was a study actually by the Center for Disinformation Control, as I like to call it, that clearly showed that uh, I believe it was 84 or 85% of people that came down with the Kung flu uh, actually were wearing a mask all the time and they still got sick. There was yeah. another 13 or 14 percent that were wearing masks just part of the time. And then we remember in the beginning, in the early stages, New York uh, Governor Cuomo, who I would consider the worst mass murderer in New York state history, uh, was actually surprised when he heard that people that were getting sick were the ones that were on lockdown in their homes. So Again, I think there's a, a lot of guesswork and white coats going on here. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, living a good life, being healthy, getting fresh air, getting fresh exercise, perhaps taking a, a multi B vitamin daily and a little zinc daily uh, is, you know, probably going to keep you pretty healthy, certainly if you're younger and you don't have any uh, pre existing conditions. Yeah, your point about masks is well taken. Uh, I think. I do laugh. I walk around and I see all sorts of types of masks being worn. If you remember way back in March, uh, Surgeon General Adams went on television and said people shouldn't be wearing masks. They wear them wrong. It will be more dangerous than if they're wearing them right. And that's true. You know, these things get wet. They lose all their effectiveness. And if you are contaminated, you're actually concentrating and getting a higher shot of the virus. So people have to learn how to use them properly. Uh, that, you know, there's always a caveat in things that when used properly, and maybe we should be saying that more, when used properly, masks can be a very effective uh, technique to mitigate you or someone else getting a virus. I also see a lot of people, and this is just COVID fatigue, uh, where the masks are down, they don't cover your nose, it's not doing anybody good, or they wear a mask and it's a loose fitting mask. I have one that somebody gave me this thing is no no more effective than than you know putting a nothing up, up. It's all open on the sides and it breathes in, breathes out. So and then people shouldn't still be whispering in each other's ears wearing a mask. That you're just kidding yourself. So I think perhaps we should change our rhetoric. When used properly, masks can be very effective. Your other point about mask mouth, uh, as the dentists are beginning to call it, absolutely true. These yeah. people who are wearing the masks. Uh, virtually all the day and again you do need to go in you need to moisten your mouth you need to make sure you have good dental hygiene uh, to begin with um, not always the case uh, and you have to uh, you know make sure that the masks are clean I mean I did hear one 
uh, most inane recommendation from a public official uh, in the West Coast somewhere who said, well, when you go to a restaurant, take the mask down, eat, and then put the mask back on. That's, uh, that's silly. You're just, you're just hurting yourself in many other potential ways. So, um, but I will, again, think, t t and I, I, I go to physical therapy. Because along with a bad attitude, I have a bad knee and a bad back. So when I was a physical therapy, I asked the therapist, I said, gee, you know, I'm wearing a mask while I'm doing this, these exercises, and it really is a strain. So I know firsthand that it puts a strain on you. I looked it up, and there was this very small study that was done that looked at the oxygenation of individuals doing exercise with a mask on and doing exercise with a mask off. They didn't see a big difference, but these were only 20-minute exercise uh, regimens. So we'll, we'll learn a lot more when this is done. But, you know, I, I and what you said also struck me, we're, we're doing a lot of guess science, folks in white coats are guessing a lot, and you're right. You're absolutely right. The fact of the matter is there are no facts to go on. Yep. We, all the smart people in the world who are uh, earnest and honest and sworn oaths to help humanity, we've never seen this before. We've never seen a virus like this before. We've never had to manage it in the era of the Internet before. We've never had this huge financial impact as is causing mental health issues and suicides and drug addiction. So I, I try to refrain from being too harsh for some of my colleagues who I disagree with because we've never seen this before. Next time we go around the block, hopefully not, but if we go around <laughs> the block and I'm around to see it, we should know a lot better. But I think I give them a little bit of grace because I don't think anybody in the white coats are trying to do harm. I really don't. Well, uh, as, as we wrap up here, Dr. Sal, how do we get a hold of you online, my friend? Well, you can reach me through the Men's Health Network. That's the organization I represent when I'm doing these uh, these programs. Uh, it's www.menshealthnetwork.org. Uh, it's a 25-year-old uh, organization that advocates the health, welfare, and education of boys, men, and their families. So there's lots of great information there. Fantastic. Well, Josh, uh, give us a wrap-up here on your end, my friend. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Sal, it was a pleasure speaking with you. I've never spoken to you in the past, and hopefully we can do more uh, back and forth because uh, I'm happy pretty confident that the people that are watching this uh, probably enjoyed it just as much as yes. I enjoyed having the conversation <laughs> with you. Uh, I'm, as far I'm, as... Like this uh, like verbally debate. <laughs> absolutely, yes. Uh, as far as me, uh, you yeah. can go to joshburnsteinuncensored.com. Again, Josh Bernstein uncensored.com please sign up at the website that's where we cover lots of things that social media would have taken down and would have banned uh, but on the website we cover it all really interesting stuff and then um, of course uh, AMAC the Association of Mature American Citizens you can check them out at amac.us you can call them toll free at 888-262-2006 tell them you heard about AMAC on the Jiggy Jaguar program and they'll even give you a free one-year introductory membership just for mentioning the Jiggy Jaguar program. So call them up again at 888-262-2006 or find them on the web at amac.us. Well, Dr. Sal, Josh, I appreciate it, gentlemen. We will definitely have to do this again. This was uh, kind of a thrown-together segment at the last minute, but this was fantastic. You guys have uh, done amazing, so uh, thank you. And, Josh, th thanks for providing your insight as always Absolutely. my friend get this to me and i'll put this up for sunday morning definitely i'm sending it as as we go but thank you dr Excellent. sal thank you josh dr. Sal, I'll... my pleasure speaking with you sir i'm happy to, do it again. happy to do this again <laughs> you will be safe appreciate right. it gentlemen and uh we are going to take a time out when we come back we have got more coming up it is the world famous cheeky jaguar radio broadcast back here in